Mitch said, we've been in the book of Galatians for quite a while now, and the theme's been freedom, and it, you know, what if I gave a pop quiz this morning and said, okay, define freedom in terms of what Paul is talking about. Would you be able to be able to articulate that? And I think it's, it, it's critical because we, t- we sing about it, we talk about it, but what does it mean, and how does that really influence who we are? Uh, I tell you what, freedom in Christ is not what Paul is what, what Paul's not talking about here. Back in 2003, uh, I was reading the newspaper, and it was shortly after the liberation of Iraq, and in particular Baghdad. And during this time, you remember the statue of Saddam Hussein came down and all that stuff. Well, there's a, there's a, in the picture, in the paper, was a guy driving his car down the wrong way on a street with a gun out the window firing, and, and he's yelling, freedom, I love freedom. And obviously, that is not freedom. That, that is the opposite of freedom. Even though he may have thought, you know, break down all the laws and the rules and we can just live however we want to live. But that is not what Paul is getting at at all. But for a lot of us, we think, okay, if all the incentives are removed from, you know, from this thing, if, you know, of living a holy life, if there's no incentive, if God accepts me, no matter what I do in Christ, that I'm accepted. I can't earn God's love more by the things I do or don't do. And if I can't, uh, you know, please God, you know, I can please God, but if I can't allow him to accept me more because of my actions or all my sins, if they're forgiven past, present, and future in the cross, you know, if God's forgiven me all that, then, what, then what's the deal? I mean, how, what stops me from just living life however I want to live it? And, and, and Paul is going to make it clear in this section that, you know what? This freedom changes your heart. This freedom in Christ changes your heart. And this freedom that you have in Christ is, and if you remember last week talked about how that in the Old Testament there were two things required for for salvation, just like in the New Testament. There there was faith on our part and atonement on God's part. If you remember we talked about how that during the Old Testament time, every year a sacrifice had to be made for the uh, atonement of sin. But New Testament is under Christ, we can come boldly before God's throne. The priest could only go in once a year. And you remember when he went in, he had to be very, very careful. Because if he went in without doing all the things that God said, you know, these are the prerequisites before going in, then he would find himself dead. And for us as Christians, we have the freedom to enter God's throne boldly. We can find delight in the cross of Christ. But I guess the question I want to start out with us is, why don't we? delight more in Christ? Why don't we delight more in God? Why do we take our relationship with God for granted? Why do we feel the need to take this freedom and use it as an excuse just to live careless lives? And so Paul is going to get at this. And here's a big point I want to make today, because I think over the centuries, the church has been scared of this idea of freedom in Christ because they thought, you know, if we remove all checks and balances from people and those checklists, then people are just going to live however they want to live, you know, just any way they want to live. And I think we're going to see today that the gospel freedom from fear and condemnation leads us to obey God and want to please God and not to want to please and live for ourselves. And so as we look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 15 today, I think this is a critical passage in this book because he's kind of transitioning now from all this argument that he's made to now he's making it much more practical into their lives and he's going to refute what the, the Judaizers, really their motivation was, which was, you can just live any way you want to live, huh, if you believe the gospel Paul's teaching. So let's pray, and let's look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Father God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that all our sins are covered, past, present, and future, that there is nothing we can do to make you love us more, make you love us more, God. And God, through that, help us to see that our motivation is what you have accomplished and your Holy Spirit that you've put inside of us that drives us over and over again back to the cross and back to this freedom we have in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free, what we just sang about. And so this verse is a a transition, it's a summary of the last two chapters, and it's where Paul is going next, and he's going to talk about this whole idea of this mission that Jesus was on, which was mission of liberation. And this verb that's translated, has been set free, refers to this single past action that's now 
completed in us, that we've been set free. That's our position in Christ. We've been set free in Christ. And so in the most definitive way, Paul tells us that we have been set free. But this freedom he's going to show us is not just freedom from the law code, but it's also freedom from the bondage of sin, the things that hold us back from serving God. And what it's not, he's not talking about perfection, but he's talking about a freedom that sin doesn't have control over us any longer. And so think about your own life for a second here before we get into this more. Think about the things that constantly drag you down and pull you down. Do you believe that through Christ that you can have freedom over those things? That you can truly, truly release those things and live for God in a way that's powerful and real and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Because that's what Paul tells us. And look at in, in, in verse 1. Before we talk about that freedom, he's going to show us that this freedom, in which many of us can relate to, we can lose it. He says, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. So he says, stand firm then. And do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So he tells him, he says, you need to stand firm. Because if you don't stand firm, you could fall back into this yoke, meaning that the thing that like cattle wore when they formed fields and they, they wormed together to plow the field together, this yoke that was over them that harnessed them in. He says, you can be free from this, but you need to stand firm in what you believe. And what's he talking about standing firm? He's talking about continually being diligent in our relationship with Christ to remember our salvation, remember the grace that he showed us, to persevere with it, to rejoice in it, to delight in it, to live according to our salvation. And so we're going to really break that down more and more here in the next few verses. But let's talk about what that practically, I mean, what that means. In Bible terms, you have justification. I mean, this is important to understand. Justification, which is when God declares you righteous, you come and you say, I need a Savior. I understand that my way or you know, living apart from God ultimately ends up being separated from God for eternity, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Justification, you came to a point where you recognize, God, you exist, Jesus died for me, and I put my hope and my faith and my trust. That's justification. God at that moment declares you righteous in his eyes. Nothing you can do can make him love you and accept you more. But then we have what's called sanctification over here. And sanctification is the, the, uh, a process of becoming holy and more like Christ in our lives. And this is a journey. It's a process. And here's the thing. The point I want to make today is sanctification is the art of getting used to our justification. Let me say that again. Sanctification, living out the holiness, is the art of understanding and, and getting used to what God has done, the sancti- this justification in our life. So as we live our life, that's why we never outgrow the simple gospel, the simple cross. That everything we do, we have to continually look back to the cross and see what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that drives us, that motivates us, that gives us the power to live the life that we cannot live on our own. So it allows the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out and allows us to rest in what he's done and rest in him but see what happens so many times is this idea of living out our justification that we put our faith in Christ but then we continue to be enslaved by this mindset that we had before Christ let me, let me illustrate this to help you out and, and I think this will make it more make more sense all right when I was a kid my mom really she, she had this stickler rule that we were not to eat junk food or really anything before a meal so you know after lunch you know and and up to she usually made dinner around 5 five thirty. all right we couldn't just go in the closet and eat junk food right before the time she was preparing the meal so she's in the kitchen she's making the meal preparing the meal and she hears us opening the pantry door and she says no snacking before your meal okay and and so we you know we had our hands in the cookie jar we let go and okay yes ma'am can't can't do that all right, well, let's fast forward years later. I'm free from my mom's authority and rule, okay? I've, I've moved on into adulthood now, okay? But yet the first few years of being an adult, being on my own, I found to be true that if, even if I was preparing the meal, if I went and started getting snack food before that, I would feel guilty. I would feel like I was doing something wrong. I would feel like I was still enslaved to my mom's authority to say, don't do that, all right? And that's what we do so many times in our salvation. 
we become still are enslaved to this way of thinking that's apart from Christ. It's apart from the cross. And so we have to constantly remind ourselves, that's not who I am any longer. I'm not under the rule and authority of sin. I'm not under the rule and authority of the power of Satan. But I am a child of God. I'm an heir of God in Christ. And that's the mindset we have to remind ourselves. So that's why we never outgrow or outlive the gospel. And so God has freed us from the things to which we're still enslaved as a Christian. So you have to work the gospel down deep in you in order to run free for what Christ has done for you and who you are in Christ. So allowing the gospel to run deep down in you. So what does that look like practically? It means just constantly focusing upon, God, I thank you that apart from Jesus, that I would be destined for an eternally, eternity separated from you. God, thank you for your grace, because I am a wretched sinner. The worst sinner I know is when I look in the mirror and see myself, that's the worst sinner that I know. And we understand and grasp more and more of God's grace and his love and his forgiveness. And out of that becomes our delight, understanding, God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the cross. And if your prayer life, if your time with God doesn't incorporate meaningful interaction with God, thanking him for what he's done for us through Christ, then you're missing out on delighting in Christ and knowing Christ and truly not being a burden again, as he says in verse 1, by the slavery. So being burdened again, it's an anxiety, it's a fear of, God, I've got to, I've got to do something, I've got to earn it. And what happens is, it's very subtle in most of our lives, because most of you were raised in churches where you understood that the gospel is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And so maybe you know that it's not about earning God, but it's very subtle how it sneaks in and how you begin to default on what you do versus your relationship with God. And so here's, here's the question to throw back to you to keep this really personal in our own lives is, what does your time with Christ look like? What does your time with God look like on a daily basis? Because it's so dangerous to try to have some form of morality and some good deeds without any power to it. In fact, I would dare say that if you're living your life, not only are you not helping the cause of Christ, you're probably hurting the cause of Christ. Because in yourselves and in myself, I'm going to make a mess and think I'm faking everybody out and doing a good job and you know I'm, I'm keeping everybody happy and they think I'm pretty moral, but in reality is... I'm under the yoke of slavery again. I'm being burdened down by that. And so Paul confronts the Galatians here in this chapter, and you're going to see as he goes through, you can just see his passion and and his his intensity kind of rise. But he wants them to make a decision. Will they make Jesus their treasure and their hope, or will they keep looking back to the law and ceremony and circumcision and those things in order to find their righteousness and their acceptance before God? They're at a point. You have to make this decision. Look what he says, verse 2. He says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. So let me, let me ask you this, all right? Most of us in the traditions that we have in, in America, most of the time our boys are circumcised when they're very young, you know, at birth or whatever. Most of us, ha- that ha- that's happened, all right? So what's he saying? If that happened to us and Christ is no value to us, no, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, during this time, remember, circumcision was definitely ne- tied into this idea of Judaism, and that was the identity, the identifier for the Jewish people. And so he says, if you think you need Jesus plus anything else, then you remove Jesus from that equation. So you can't add to Jesus without subtracting Jesus. So if you think, okay, I got Jesus, but we got to require a couple more things here, circumcision being one. He says, if you add to Jesus, you've just removed Jesus completely. And so, what do we do in our culture? Is there anything that we add? Is it Jesus plus anything? I mean, I think of, of some that are things like baptism. Baptism, all right? Baptism is an awesome thing, and it's definitely the first step for a believer. But there are churches that teach that if you don't, you're not baptized, then you're not a Christian. And it comes from a good place because Jesus commanded baptism. He baptized. Throughout the the New Testament, you see baptism talked about over and over again. But if if, if you're in this church building today and you put your faith in Christ for the first time, 
then you drive off today, and sometime this week, you call me and say, John, I really want to be baptized Sunday, and then you die before next Sunday, and you're not baptized. Do you go to heaven? Of course. Do you have eternal life? You do, because it's all about Jesus. It's not about what you add to Jesus. And if you say it's Jesus plus baptism, then you've just removed Jesus and made it about other things that you have to do. Now, with me being, saying that is every believer should be baptized. There's no reason for a believer not to be baptized. And in fact, if you resist baptism, you know, that's not a good sign because why would you want to do that? Why would you not want to be baptized? That's what Jesus told us to do, the next step in our relationship with him. And so anything that we add, so maybe some traditions they add, you know, you got to confess to a priest or you have to do this or you have to do that. Anything you add to Jesus removes Jesus. It's all about him and his grace. Verse 3, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the, the whole law. So he says, if you want to add anything, and these guys were probably eager to add a few things, but they didn't want to keep the whole law. And he says, if you add anything to it, You've got to keep it all. James 2.10 says this. It says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all of it. And so he's saying, if you want to keep the law, you can't pick and choose what you want to keep. You've got to keep it all. It all comes as a unit together. Verse 4. You who are trying to be justified, set right, remember what I defined that, made right before God, by the law, you have alienated yourself from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. So he says, you can't have it both ways. It's either salvation is by grace, through faith alone in Christ, or it's by human achievement. It's by your works. You can't have it both ways. It's one way or the other. And I think for us, sometimes that we can focus on not necessarily earning our salvation, but it's living and making God happy through the things we do and don't do. And this was so true, and I don't know if any of you grew up in churches that were very what, what I call legalistic and we talked a lot about this if you're in a K group on Wednesday nights but very legalistic meaning there were a lot of rules associated with your church and it wasn't it didn't say you had to do these things or not do these things for salvation but it was sort of part of the package okay and you were looked at as maybe um, they might not be a Christian if they go to movies or if they dance or whatever and it's this list of things that people came up with that were extra biblical that were tacked on or, or added on. And my church I grew up in was very much like that. And, and so I really struggled because almost every message the pastor preached was on hell. And it was on, you know, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to hell. And then the preacher at the end would say the sinner's prayer. And he would say, repeat after me if you don't put, have never put your faith in Christ. Well, here I am, you know, as a kid, you know, even, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. And it's constantly I'm just riddled with fear, okay, do I really, did, did I say those words right? Did I really believe it when I said it? And so the pastor would do that sinner's prayer, and I'd say it almost every time I'd say it. Okay, God, I, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm going to say this just in case I, I'm not, or I really didn't believe it, or, you know, I, you know, I can't remember if I did it exactly the right way. And I was just riddled with this guilt. And, and, and one year I went to the summer camp, and at and, and this camp in North Carolina, we had a good meaning uh, guy who was our leader in our group and it was like eight of us and but he followed me around the whole week and he kept asking me are you are you sure you're saved john are you sure you're saved i don't know why he felt the need to pick on me but he kept after me and after me and after me and it just just kind of compounded this fear and this guilt that i i lived with and i thought in my mind i thought you know if i can get rid of all these sins you know and, and these things that i'm not doing right and the things that I should be doing and if I start getting it all right and get it together then maybe at that point I won't have these struggles with this frustration and this guilt and feeling like that you know I don't know if I really know God or not and you see what I was doing I was I thought if I could be good enough then I could earn God and I totally missed this idea of grace the fact that we can never be good enough that God accepts us and so many times Church people become good at covering up or acting like they're good enough. But deep down, none of us are good enough. That's why we need grace. That's why we need Christ. That's why we need the cross. That's why we need the blood and the Savior. And so Paul is going to say, look, we're not saying that, that, you, that these things are okay just to live any way that you want to live. But you cannot put your focus upon yourself. It's got to be upon Christ and what Christ has done for you. And in this passage, he says, in this verse 4, you have fallen away from grace. He says, you don't get grace. And you can't have assurance of salvation 
if you think that you can maintain or earn your salvation. James, again, says in 2.19, he says, You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So he's saying, look, if you can't accept God's grace, you might believe in God, you might believe in Jesus that he died on the cross, but you don't believe. Because if you believed, you'd accept this grace and understand this grace. Because with true salvation comes this understanding that I need grace. And, I, and grace is what it's all about. But I think it's really important in our culture that where Christianity is slowly becoming not the norm, but it's still the norm, and especially in the South, I think it's really important to understand that in a church, there are people who claim Christ, and they have that intellectual belief in Christ, but there's no affection for Christ. There's no affection for seeing the cross. You're not moved by the cross. You're not moved by grace. And so it's easy in a church setting, and our K group did a really good job of talking about this. So guys, you can, you can check it out at this point because you, this was really good, insightful stuff, but you've heard it, all right? Um, that we do a really good job of, you know, being a culture that's Christian, and, 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 we, and we know that, you know, there's people in our churches that just believe intellectually, but they don't truly have a heart for Christ. And what that does is we look back and it's easy to be, you know, oh, okay, see, the way they live their life or they, the way they're living, you know, just proves that this, this grace thing doesn't work because these people are just living life, you know, they're a terrible example. You know, we need to be stricter on the rules and sit down on the law in the church, you know, and we need to, to, to have things for people to keep them in check. But there's people who are in part of a church, maybe even in this room here, you know that you truly don't know Christ. There's no delight in Christ whatsoever. And I think that's why in First John, John talked about these people that were part of their church at one point. In First John 2.19, he says, they went out from us, meaning they were part of their church, but they went out and they abandoned them because they didn't really belong to us in the first place. They were never truly believers in the first place. He says, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going, their leaving, their departing the faith showed that none of them belonged to us. And so we understand there's people that are part of the church, people that become members of the church, people that are baptized, people that make professions of faith. But they truly, truly don't know Christ. So as Paul's point is true Christians are saved by grace, and they show their Christians by continuing to trust in grace continuing to trust in grace. And those who fall away from grace never knew grace in the first place. That's why Paul can say in verse 10, if you skip down to verse 10, he says, I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. He says, I'm confident, people of Galatia in these churches, you're not going to take another view because he believes they're, that they're real believers. And so their positive response to his warning will show that they truly believe and put their trust in Jesus in the first place. So, Instead of striving for righteousness, look what Paul says in verse 5. He says, For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. So instead of striving, we wait. And Paul says, We wait for, we await for the faith, uh, by faith for the righteousness which we have hope in. He says, Trust God that He's going to finish what He started, Scripture says. He who began a good work in us will complete it in the day of Christ. So God works in, his, in, in children, those who are really his. He's at work in your heart. He's, he's drawing you to himself. He's asking not just for your intellect, for your heart, for your devotion to see him and savor him. Not just as your eternal ticket for heaven, but as your savior, your Lord, your friend, your master. And so instead of striving, you trust that your righteousness is secure and it's not just sitting in your hands, waiting by faith. It's not static. It's not inactive. Look what it says in verse 6. He says, but in Christ Jesus, again, circumcision, uncircumcision, doesn't have any, any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So he says this faith is going to express itself in real love, real love for others. In fact, Ephesians 2 we looked at Ephesians before we got into this book of Galatians. And in Ephesians, we talked about how that we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God even prepared those works ahead of time. And so we've been created for love. And so as we understand our position in Christ, we understand more and more the cross and what Christ did for us. Through that, we live lives of love. And we, what is love? Love is 
doing what's best for other people and not just focus on self, not focus on what can we get out of this situation or, you know, what's in it for me? Because that's most of the time the way we look at love is, you know, what's in this for me? And when it's not, there's nothing there for me anymore, then I take off. And that's not God's kind of love. God's kind of love is agape love, which is looking out for what's best for the other person, selflessly giving of yourself, even when the other person's not responding in turn. And those of you who have been married for any length of time, you know that's the secret to the, a marriage. It's not you meet me halfway, or when you give 100, I give 100. But it's you give 100 even if the other person's giving 50. Or you give 100 even if they're giving 10 or 1. That's love, is giving of yourself. And so Paul says that faith expresses itself in this kind of love. And, but our working is a but our working is, uh, this is, is, is a product of our faith. It's not a substitute for it. Let me say that again. It's a product of our faith. It's not a substitute for it. We don't substitute love for faith, but faith, real faith, love comes out of that. So maybe a better way to say it, we do not work for righteousness, but it comes out of our righteousness. We don't work for righteousness, but love comes out of our righteousness, and it's our fuel to live for Christ. And then look at verse 7. He says, to the Galatians, he says, you are running a good race. You are doing well. You, you, you seemed like you really got this. He says, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? So he says, he uses his race metaphor, and he says, you were doing good. And these Judaizers, these false teachers, they came in, and they just bumped you off the course. And they kept you from running the race that God's called you to run. Let's turn this on ourselves for a second. Paul uses this analogy of a race and of running. How's your Christian life? How's your faith? How's your race going? Is it cross-based, grace-based, and from that flows love? Or is it, went to church, didn't do that, don't do this, I do that. Check, 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 check. And that's what Paul's implications for us is. It's about delighting in God. Our heart's affection and our mind's attention our life's devotion upon Jesus Christ. He says, verse 8, he says, that kind of persuasion, meaning being bumped off the, the, the track, doesn't come from the one who calls you. This false teaching, these things that you're believing now, he said, it doesn't come from Christ. It doesn't come from God. God's not the author of this. He says, you need to put a stop to it. Why? Verse 9, because a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Again, he gives an analogy, a picture. He says, he says, just like yeast permeates and spreads out through the bread, the same thing happens in the church. A little bit of false doctrine here, a little bit of lies here. A few people believe it, and then pretty much, pretty soon, it just takes it over, and it takes over. He says, we need to put a stop to this. You can't spread this false teaching. And then he kind of really hits where you can see that he's really, really being passionate here. He says, in verse 10 through 12, he says, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no, no other view. Then he gives a warning. The one, the one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. So he says, this is a big deal. It's a big deal. He says, brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And that verse may seem confusing, but basically what he's saying is, these Judaizers were maybe claiming that Paul even agreed with their teaching or that maybe at some point in his uh, in his uh, Christian life, he had been teaching this as well. And he said, and that's not true. He said, if I was preaching circumcision, if I was still uh, you know, believing that the law and keeping these things is what makes me part of God's family, he said, why would these Judaizers be persecuting me and trying to discredit me? And then verse 12, he gets to the point where you see that he truly shows his frustration, his irritation, even maybe anger. He says, as for these agitators, I wish they would go all the way and emasculate themselves. What's that mean? He's saying, I wish they'd just mutilate themselves, castrate themselves is what he's getting at here. He's saying, and here's the point. It could be taken a couple different ways, but what he's saying is, hey, if, if, if these Judaizers are teaching that, you know, taking off a little flesh is more spiritual and makes you more accepting to God, then, you know, doing more would even make you more acceptable to God. And, and you can see he's being facetious. He's being sarcastic, but he's also being, he's mad. He's upset. He's saying, these guys, maybe he's trying to say these false teachers should just be cut off completely. You need to just cut them off. But whatever the point, Paul is very passionate about this false teaching. 
And I know we live in a day and age where, you know, we live and let live and, you know, whatever it believes, you know, don't bother them. That, you know, they let them, you know, have their belief and I'll have my belief and we're all just happy. But Paul would not go for that for one minute. He realizes the danger of Paul's teaching and how it can corrupt the church. And he says, you have to deal with this. You have to deal with this false teaching. And then verse 13 through 15, he's going to get back to where we started at from the beginning. This fear the false teachers had, their motivation was this. The lack of law equals a license to sin. A lack of law equals a license to sin. And practically that makes sense, doesn't it? All right? Who's, uh, has anybody ever driven in Montana before? Anybody been out to Montana to drive? All right, why do you laugh, Roy? <laughs> why? You can go as fast as you want. Well, they say, don't they say within a reasonable speed limit? Right. Okay, not really. And so the lack of law, that's what it does. It says, you know what? There's nothing holding me in check here, so I'm going to go whatever I want to go, even if it means that you're unsafe or yourself or others. And so you see, there's need for law and there's need for structure. But Paul's going over and over again saying, but it's not the law of Moses. It's not keeping the commands of, of Moses and circumcision. Those are not what keeps a believer in check. It's the Holy Spirit. And the ministry of the word through the Holy Spirit is what drives us to holiness and, and makes us understand that living a holy and sanctified life and set apart life, that's what it's about. It's about understanding what Christ has done through the gospel. And through that, we understand that we live lives that look different than our culture and different than our society. So it's never about just living life any way that you want to live. Oh, no speed limit. You know, I'm gone. It's not about not having a speed limit, but it's about the Holy Spirit using God's word and speaking through his word and then allowing those other areas, those gray areas, the Holy Spirit to set convictions in our own life for what? So we're, we look better? No, for the sake of the gospel. So the gospel can go out and spread more and more. And people can see that Christians truly follow Christ and live different than this culture. But during this time period of, of, of these Judaizers, I mean, the world was a terrible place. I mean, we look at the world now, we know it's a terrible place, all right? You can't not open a newspaper or read online and see all the awful, terrible things that are happening in our society. And we think sometimes, you know, wow, the world is just, this is the worst it's ever gotten. But the world was a pretty bad place during the time of Paul. In fact, the Roman world, this comes out of one of, one of the books during the Roman time, during this time period. This is what a Roman writer said. He said, we, meaning men, we keep mistresses for, for pleasures, concubines for day-to-day -day needs of the body, but, but we have wives in order to produce children legitimately and to have a trustworthy guardian of our homes. Wow. It's pretty sad, right? And during this time, if you go back and read in the literature of the day, I mean, homosexuality was rampant. Um, incest was prevalent. It was a very, very terrible situation back then. So you understand that the Judaizers, you know, we've got to keep things in order here. But look what Paul says. You, my brothers and sisters, verse 13, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So he said, this freedom is not to indulge the flesh. It's not just to live whatever feels good and right in the flesh. And in the flesh, what he always con uh, Paul always sets that opposite of the spirit. You have the Holy Spirit working in one way, and then the flesh the opposite way. And so the best way maybe to understand this is the Holy Spirit leads us into holiness and goodness and, and love, and then the flesh is the opposite, which is self-love. Self-promotion, doing whatever seems right at the moment, making myself happy versus through the Spirit, delighting in God. And here's, here's the cool thing is that when we truly delight in God, Scripture says God gives us the desires of our heart. And many people take that and run with it like that means God gives you like fortune and, and whatever else you want. But what, what it means is that, that when you delight in God, you find your joy in the things of God. And so many people, their whole back to, to faith in Christianity is like, oh, it's such a restricting, terrible life. You know, if you follow Christ, then you can't do all this stuff and have fun. And, and, and as I've grown in my relationship with God, I can honestly say the more that I delight in God, the happier I am in the things that God says, these are the things 
that you should indulge in. Be, be just overzealous to, to love. Have joy and peace and patience. And there's things that we're going to talk about next week, which are the fruit of the Spirit. We see that in those things, in those attitudes, in those, in those expressions, we find such joy that our life is at a place where we're content no matter what comes our way, no matter how tough life gets, that we find contentment, satisfaction, meaning in that. And so for people, especially younger people in here, that maybe you have, you know, you're in high school or, or, and you think, you know what, one day maybe I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to live free and, and, and just live, you know, whatever way I want for a, a while and then maybe come back to Christ. I want to tell you that some of the most fulfilled people I've ever known are people who said, as a young person said, I'm going to follow Christ. And whatever adventure that he gives me or sends me on, that's what I'm going to pursue. And in that, they found such peace and delight and fulfillment. It doesn't mean it's carefree and, 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 and no pain or no difficulties. But in that path, they find that God meets them in a way that's so special and real because they're living out his purposes and his direction. So be careful not to buy into this idea that, you know what, Christ is restricting. Is, it, is this going to make my life terrible? And don't buy into this idea that, you know what, freedom means just I live whatever way I want to live because I got my salvation. And it's all good because God, you know, he, he's not going to reject me because I believe that, you know, I'm a Christian and so therefore I believe in Jesus so he's not going to turn me away. Freedom never means the right to do as you please. Never means the right to do as you please. Freedom is the power of, to obey the Holy Spirit and live a life of love because Christ lives in us. Christ lives in us. And we delight in him and we live a life of love. So let's take a practical example and we're almost finished. Let's take, about, let's take something like lying or cheating, okay? Tax time's coming up, April 15th, soon be here. All right, you're doing your taxes and you can fudge a little bit on maybe some expense that you had or... Or, or some work-related thing that you can write off, and you say, well, you know what, I can up this number, and you know, the IRS will probably never notice. Her. And you can lie on there and, and as a Christian, knowing that, you know what, God's not going to reject me. God loves me. I can lie on here, and he'll still love me the same as if I'm honest on this. And then also, other people can look at it like, you know, I've got to be honest, because I've got to be honest in every area of my life, because if I'm not honest in every area of my life, then God's going to reject me. He's not going to, he's not going to love me. I'm going to lose my salvation, or, or he's going to be against me. And that legalistic mindset is wrong as well, because I promise you, I don't care how honest you are in here, at some point, some kind of lie is going to come out of you, and that's why we need grace and we need Christ. But over here, this, this person, and they think, okay, I can fudge on this because God loves me the same. It doesn't really matter. Let me ask you a, a, a couple questions. Why do you even want to lie? Why do you want to lie? Well, because if I lie, I get more money. And if I get more money, then I can do the stuff that I want to do. Well, that's why we have to get to the heart of the matter. And the, matter, the heart of the matter is that you're not delighting in God. You're not delighting in Him. And you're having what well, I'm going to call functional, a functional Savior, which is, you know what, Jesus, I know you're the Savior, but money is my real Savior. Because the more money I have, the more happy I am and joyful I am. And so money has replaced Jesus as your Savior and as your God. And that's your idol. And so as, as parents, we have to do this with our kids all the time. We have to ask, instead of saying, do not do that. Why? Because it's, it's wrong. Don't do that. We have to speak to their hearts as well and understand. Let me help you understand why that replaces Christ. Why the goal of what you, you want to do is trying to replace your delight in something, put your delight in something else other than in Jesus. And it's a lot harder, isn't it? And, and we, I don't do a very good job at it, like pausing and saying, here's why. But that's why we need to spend regular intentional time with our children because it's great to have those times where we teach and help understand it's about the heart of the matter. What's, what's your heart delighting in? What's it finding its satisfaction in? Because it doesn't matter if you're the most moral person in the world, if it's not rooted and based in Jesus Christ, then it doesn't matter. It's going to be burned up at the end. It will not have value whatsoever. But your purpose is 
to obey Christ, honor Christ, glorify Christ, if that's the desire of your heart, then out of that flows our morals and our values. And our delighting in God comes out of that, is, comes a holy life. So a person who knows the gospel in their affections and in their intellectual understanding will say, I don't need that thing, money, whatever it is, therefore I can be honest, I can tell the truth, because I don't need that to bring me fulfillment. So you see the difference? You see the difference? It's about your heart. Where are your affections of your heart at? And as, 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 as believers, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and he drives us, he moves true Christians to delighting in Christ. And then verse 14 and 15 is kind of, a, kind of a connected more to the next passage, but I want to go ahead and just introduce it, and we'll be finished. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So he says, you want, you want to live out the law? Here's the law to live out. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on that. Love God and love others. Love God and love others. So, a couple things to take away. One is, what needs to change for you to delight in the cross? I would say practically, for a lot of you and for myself, it just means slowing down. Being intentional. Setting time aside to truly spend with God. And you think, well, I'm just so busy. What's your purpose? What's your purpose for being here? Are these things that you're running and being busy with, is that your purpose? Those things can be part of your purpose. But your motivation comes from your delight in the cross. And as you delight in Jesus, as you delight in the cross, then you can love other people in just an extravagant, unexpected, crazy ways. So who do you need to love in that way? First and foremost, Jesus. And then in your, in your life, where you need to be showing love, the love of Christ. In your job, in your home, in your family, extended family. Who needs to see the love of Christ? Because they're not going to see it in a life that's indulging self. Yeah, I want money, or I want ease or comfort or pleasure. If those things are your God, they're not going to see Jesus Christ living through you. Freedom. It's not indulging. It's living through the power of the Holy Spirit and loving others as a result. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that convicts our hearts, that moves us to you, it causes us to wake up to just how lethargic and asleep we can be spiritually, and it moves us to, to, to Jesus. And I thank you for the cross. I thank you out of the cross comes our love and motivation to serve you. God, we pray that you will help us to not just be propelled to live a day or two or an hour or two as a result of your word, but God, help each person here to truly seek to be alone with you each and every day and, and let that carry them throughout the day as they seek to fulfill their purpose of loving you and loving their neighbor as themselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.